Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library. It is a pleasure uh, to uh, uh, welcome you here to the library tonight to hear Robert Kaplan, a uh, native son uh, who's made good and done good. I also want to thank uh, a sponsor who wishes to remain unknown, a great philanthropist of Kansas City who sponsored our reception. And I, I, I mention that even though she wishes to remain unknown to point out that we have uh, many needs at the Kansas City Public Library for support. Um, and uh, it, was, it was very nice of this person to, uh, uh, to, to support uh, our reception tonight. And it's why it's a particularly nice reception. So thank you. But tonight, we have a great program. And as I said, we have a native son. I uh, grew up in uh, Prairie Village, went to Shawnee Mission, uh, which uh, uh, tells you that, that you, you know, you can't, Kansas Cityans can get out and about uh, because he's gone on to, uh, to a great career. He was a, he was a partner at Pete Marwick and, and, and uh, Mitchell uh, here in, in Kansas City. Uh, went to work for uh, uh, a small boutique investment house called Goldman Sachs. <laughs> small joke there. Um, and uh, I became the, the co-head of their investment banking division. Uh, I was head of their corporate finance department, head of their Asia Pacific investment banking, uh, and uh, obviously had a very distinguished career uh, in investment banking. But he's done a lot more than that. Uh, he, he is teaching uh, currently at, at the Harvard uh, Business School. That's a small boutique university in Boston. Um, and uh, he's co-chaired, uh, the uh, uh, founding co-chair of the Harvard Neuro Discovery Center Advisory Board, co-chairman of the board uh, uh, project uh, on ALS. Um, he's been on the board of the Harvard Medical School, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, the governor of Kansas, the then governor of Kansas, uh, now the head of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, appointed him a member of the Kansas Health Care Policy uh, Authority Board. Uh, he's been on the board of State Street Corporation, which is, of course, one of Kansas City's biggest uh, employers. And to prove that he knows how to clean up in this business, he uh, was a 15-year board member of Bed Bath & Beyond. Sorry for that joke. <laughs> Um, in, in his excellent book, What to Ask uh, the Person in the Mirror, uh, about leadership, um, I find as someone, as someone who's tried out a few forms of leadership myself, that it, the good news is that you can expect to spend a large part of your time, uh, to quote uh, Robert Kaplan, confused, discouraged, and unsure. I've spent the last 12 years, actually, in that state, which means that when I finally get to diagnosis, regrouping, and moving forward, the next, the next stage, I will have had a lot of experience. Um, he, he talks about asking the right questions, and I think in my own experience in, uh, in leadership, it, that's exactly it. That's the, the core uh, inquiry, uh, and, and asking questions. Uh, you don't know all the answers, and, and, uh, and so, so finding out the, the right questions is, is how ultimately to find out the, the right answers. And then he talks about vision, and he uses as one of his examples of uh, vision Ewing Kaufman. Ewing Kaufman, when he bought the Royals, announced in Kansas City uh, that uh, in, 19, in 1970, so 1969, that within five years uh, we would have uh, a championship uh, team. Well, it took a little bit longer. It took us 10 years to get into the championships and 15 years uh, to win one. And uh, uh, but but that kind of vision is that kind of vision, that kind of commitment is exactly right, and what Robert Kaplan's excellent book is about. And so we're bringing him back to Kansas City uh, next time to become an advisor to the current management of the Royals. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Kaplan. Thank you, Crosby. I appreciate it. And. Uh, and also, again, thank you to the anonymous uh, donor of the reception tonight, or also appreciate that. And it's great to be here in Kansas City. Uh, so I grew up here. I went to the University of Kansas. Uh, as was mentioned, I worked at Pete Marwick uh, at the Commerce Building, just not that far from here. Uh, but I spent most of my professional career uh, at Goldman Sachs, that dreaded firm that's so highly talked about right now. Uh, but I ran businesses there for 22 years. Uh, and uh, my last job was vice chairman of the firm, and I oversaw uh, all the client businesses, uh, investment banking globally and investment management globally. So um, I took a leave of absence in the fall of 2005 uh, and to be an instructor at Harvard Business School. Left my office at the firm, and it's an arrangement I worked out with my boss at the time, 
who was the CEO of the firm, that I would come back after three months. And I, and I decided to go ahead. If I ever had the guts to leave uh, and get out of Wall Street, I decided this was a great time to do it. This is back in 2005. And I stayed there as an instructor, thinking I might run another business. And what happened in, you remember, in 2007 and 8, during the financial crisis, the endowment of Harvard, uh, as was been well reported, had its problems. And so the president of the university asked me to go there and help fix it and work through it for three months. But I wound up living there for about a year and a half and running it for a year and a half. And so that was my detour. Uh, and I went back to teach. And now I'm a be, actually been, I'm now a professor there. And I have now have a permanent appointment to be a professor. And, uh, and so I've, I've turned out, I didn't expect to be an academic. I didn't expect certainly didn't expect to write a book. I did not expect to teach. But it's turned out to be a fabulous thing for me to do, except I had to relearn a whole new, uh, or new, learn anew, a whole new set of skills. Um, but I work with as many companies today as I ever have, in some ways more. But I work with them much more now on strategy, leadership issues, and, um, and other sensitive topics that they don't have, where people running businesses have nobody to talk to, and I spend most of my days talking to people about those kinds of issues. Now, um, and I teach a leader, I teach three leadership classes. One is a first year required leadership at Harvard Business School called LEAD. Uh, and then I teach a spring course called Leadership and Corporate Accountability, which is about governance, ethics, uh, also required course for all first years. And then I teach a third course called The Authentic Leader, which is the most touchy-feely course probably at Harvard Business School, which is about self-discovery. And this, this course was innovated by and, and come up with by the former CEO of Medtronic in Minneapolis, uh, Bill George, who's become a great friend. And is, I met through the, because he's on the board of Goldman Sachs, and that's how I met him. And so we teach that together. Uh, and I'm writing a second book right now called Reaching Your Potential, which is really based on what I've been doing with people the last 15 years in that area, trying to understand themselves and reach their potential. But the reason I wrote this book, even though I didn't intend to, I first wrote an article in Harvard Business Review about four years ago on this subject, and, and on both subjects. What to ask the person in the mirror and reaching your potential. And I thought, OK, I said everything I had to say, and I'm certainly not capable of writing a book, and I don't want to write a book. But after going through the last five or six years and all the pain and suffering, uh, I had my own pain and suffering in my own career, but after having seen all the pain and suffering and confusion of the last five or six years, I decided, you know what, maybe it does make sense to write a book about some of these experiences. So that's what I put in this book. And what I've learned is, um, and by the way, I'm going to talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we can talk about anything you want to talk about, including the stock market, which is what I spent half my life on. Uh, but, but what I've learned from the last five or six years and in my own career over 22 years at Goldman Sachs is leadership really isn't about having all the answers. And it took me about 15 years of getting my brains beat in before I finally realized that. And, uh, and I finally realized that unless I start asking questions, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, and the most important thing that I've learned, I'd say, over the last 20, 25 years is not how to answer a question. It's how instead how to frame a question. And that took me a very, very, very long time to learn how to do. When I say how to frame a question, how to figure out what's the burning issue here? What's bothering me? What's the problem in this business? How to frame it? And then how to ask it in a way that we can have a discussion and get from here to here to a solution. And any of you who've run businesses know exactly what I'm talking about. But the problem I've found is, a lot of, if, I did a, if I did a poll here and asked each of you to define what leadership is, of 100 people, I'd get 100 different answers. None of us know. None of us know. And the truth is, we all have our own conceptions based on our own backgrounds, idiosyncrasies, and watching others what we think a leader does. We think it's what we see on television. We think it's these perfect people who are very charming, and they seem to always, eh, no, never. Uh-uh. Doesn't work that way. And I know a lot of these leaders have been advisor to many of these leaders. And it turns out that the great leaders are people who have the uh, wherewithal 
to stop, reflect, step back and ask questions when they're in trouble. And they're, every leader I've ever met is in trouble at some point or feels like doing a lousy job or can't understand why they're no good at their job and everybody else has it so much easier than they do. Haven't met one yet. And I've worked with a lot of the great people I think extremely highly of who've run great companies. And so what I've learned is what makes the difference between a good leader or a mediocre leader and a great leader is the ability to step back and ask a question and be confident enough to ask a question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zip through here and literally zip, and I'm going to go through four or five examples. There's only seven or eight questions in this book, okay? And I'm going to, and there, and if you were expecting a sophisticated uh, presentation about a highfalutin, very sophisticated questions, you ain't going to get it here because these are brutally, brutally basic. And if you could answer, or if you could ask them regularly and frame them you would be Superman or woman. Seriously, it is hard to do this despite how basic it is. And, that, and I'm gonna go, go through what I mean. And here's the first one. And I took these pictures off Google and it turns out anybody can do it. And so, uh, <laughs> as my nephew in the back has explained to me, uh, but it took me a while to get that too. Um, but here's the, the, the fundamental the, the most important question, if you're running an operation or you're running an enterprise of any kind, nonprofit, the most important thing is, is what's your vision? Now, I used to hear, remember, you remember when George, the first George Bush was president? Some of you old enough, and they used to, used to talk jokingly about the vision thing. I must admit, when I heard that, I never knew what they were talking about. And, and, I, and I worked in a business where the CEO used to be pressed by everybody saying, what's your vision? And he had to come up with a vision. And all I ever thought when I heard that was, I'm glad I'm not CEO, you know? Because I don't know what they're talking about. Seriously, I don't know what they're talking about. What is a vision? I have no clue what it is. It took me a number of years to figure it out when I got in a job, and here's what it is. And by the way, everyone in this room has a vision for what you're doing. You may not think you do, but I assure you, and if I was gonna be obnoxious, I'd get you, which I won't be, uh, I would get you to take out a pen and write down your vision, but let me explain what it is. A vision is your aspiration, your dream. Everyone in this room has a dream. And if you're running any kind of enterprise, or you're running your family, you have a dream. You know, Martin Luther King described a dream. Ewing Kaufman, as Crosby said, he had a dream. All of you, Crosby has a dream for this library. I am sure of that, an aspiration. What, do I, what is the dream? It's how, I'm going, how am I going to add value to others? How do I add value in this business or this nonprofit? How does the library add value? How are we going to add value? Or to my family? Second, it has to be realistic based on what distinctive competence what is it that we do well? And I gotta tell you, every business or leader that is successful for a sustainable period of time is able to articulate a clear vision, a clear aspiration about what they're trying to do, which is again, two things. Impact on others, how are we gonna make a positive impact on others? If we run, if it's Avis Car Rental, or if it's this library, or if it's Goldman Sachs, you name it. And when businesses get away from that and they start thinking it's about them or how to make money, as we've seen for the financial crisis, that's when they get in a lot of trouble. How do you add value to others? If you add value to others and you build a distinctive competence, you'll figure out a way to make money. Okay, this is also true, um, okay, so this is also true if you're President of the United States. You have to articulate a vision for the country. And whether we think about it or not, uh, we know it when a leader is not articulating a clear vision. Uh, Barack Obama, I, I will just say it, I voted for him so I can say what I'm about to say. He was a vision, in my opinion, a visionary candidate. And you would say, what was the vision? To me, the vision was not, it wasn't, he said change, it was unification. There's no black America, there's no white America, there's no rich America, there's no poor America, there's just the United States of America. Remember that speech? Most famous speech he ever gave, we forget it now. It was about unification. We can pull together and solve our problems. 
If you ask me now, what's his vision as president? And I've been there to Washington to visit, and I've visited there and said, and, and have written some things for them. I don't know what their vision is. I really don't. I've seen some trial balloons. Latest one is an economy built to last. You heard that one recently? What's their vision for the country? And when you don't articulate a vision, even as President of the United States, other people attribute a vision to you. He's a socialist. He's a, uh, you know, because people don't know what you want. This is true for every leader. If you're running a small business, big business, President of the United States. And so the number one thing I try to do with business leaders and anybody trying to do an enterprise is say, what's the vision? And people come to me with problems literally every day, and they always, they never come to me to say I'm having trouble with my vision. They always come to problems and say, I'm having trouble with, I think I need to fire five of my people because they, we can't agree. Or I think, I think I'm a lousy manager because I'm having this, this, and this, and this problem. And the normally I'll ask, what's the vision for your business? And they'll say, what? And I'll say, what's the vision? Well, and they'll show me their annual report, and here, that, that's not the vision. What's, how are you going to add value based on what distinctive competence? And sometimes, ironically, very successful leaders can't clearly articulate it, or they could five and ten years ago, but the world changed. And that's the problem with visions. They must be updated. Okay, now, why is this so important? If you're a leader, you've got to not only be able to write yours down, that's step one, but you've got to over-communicate it. It's not enough to have one. You've got to express it. You got an organization with people, think, think how powerful it is. Think of the great companies and great organizations out there. They have a leader that articulates a very clear vision that is well understood. People talk about Jack Welch and they say good things and bad things, but I'll tell you one thing that I am certain about about Jack Welch. You talk about a clear vision, clear as a bell. And he changed it every four or five years, but very clear on what they were trying to do, and he communicated over and 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 over, and over again. Now, some people say to me, well, how often do you want me to communicate this? Well, I'll, and, and I'll get to this in a moment, because I'm, I'm talking about priorities. I, and I normally say, you should, you, you should communicate it enough so that your people begin to mock you. <laughs> and I say that kiddingly, but I'm really not kidding. They need to know, they got it, we got it, we got it, like, we got it. Okay, But the power of articulating a clear vision is it tells people what you want and when you're not there, which you almost never are, when they're out with a customer or a client or whatever, they have a general idea but they don't know what to do. They think, okay, what is our vision? What are we trying to do? We're trying to add this kind of value to clients based on this distinctive competence. Therefore, in this situation, I probably, I don't know what to do, but I probably should do this. Okay, there's a client, want, a customer wants to return a good they bought. I don't know what, we have policies, but I don't know if I should take this back in this case. But they understand, here's what we're trying to do to add value to customers. Okay, I'll take it back. I'm, making, I'm gonna make a decision. But it's a powerful thing. And it's the reason many businesses get in trouble. And some people, I teach every owner president class at Harvard Business School, so I teach MBAs but I teach executives and we get about 1,000 a year. And there's always a few executives that raise their hand on this vision thing and they say, money, that's the vision. What a stupid question. It's to make money. And I'll say, okay, that's fine. Here's the issue. People in an organization, including the leader, need a reason to jump out of bed in the morning. And my experience is money gets you to jump out of bed maybe once, a couple of times. You have to keep reminding yourself, I'm making a lot of money. We're making." But no, people run out of gas. They run out of steam if it's money. If, if it's about how to value, add value to somebody else, we're going to be the best, we're going to be number one, we're going to be the highest quality. You know, that gets people excited. You know, I teach at Harvard Business School, I want to be the best professor at Harvard. It's not going to happen, but I want to be the best, but I'd like it to be, but I'm working at it. I want to be the best professor there. When I was at Goldman Sachs, I want I, everything, I want to put ourselves in the shoes of the client, and I want to decide what you would do if you were the client, and that's the advice we ought to give them. Every single, and people get that, and that gets people excited. And, and so this would help build a sustainable business. 
We'll come back to Goldman Sachs, because some of you will ask, well, what happened to Goldman Sachs? So they don't seem to say that about it, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, vision is not enough, though. So you start with a vision. Second thing you got to do, you got to break it down into specific priorities. And I mean specific tasks we need to be great at to achieve the vision, okay? So for example, in the firm I was in, if, we really wanna, if you really want to be great at adding value to clients and put yourself in the shoes of the client, decide what you would do if you were them, it's not enough to do that. You have to have great product expertise. You have to have build strong relationships with them, which means you have to understand their needs, for example. Those are two I would call those priorities. Third thing, we need to attract and retain superb people because clients don't want to really take advice from people they don't think highly of. So those are three big priorities. I got them on my wall, and, I'm, and everything I do is focused on trying to focus and, and deliver those priorities. Now, it's not that I don't have 10 other things on my to-do list, but the reason I mention this, most people uh, have things they're trying to do, but they, have, may, they might have seven or eight or nine or 10. And here's the issue. Um, if you have 10 priorities, I would argue that's the same as having zero. You have no priorities. Priorities means you have to choose the top three or four. Now, some people say, gee, maybe you should be able to choose six or seven. I don't think so. I just wrote a case on, uh, and I used to cover Macy's for many years, Macy's the department store. And I wrote a case on Terry Lundgren, and I spent a lot of time with Terry Lundgren. Macy's was kind of a sleepy, and I can just say this, and he would say it, a sleepy uh, department store for many years. It has now run, I think, I'm amazed how well Terry Lundgren runs Macy's today. But he's, he doesn't even have three priorities. We've talked about, he's got one or two. And why does he, because he's got 400,000 employees, they've got 900 stores, and they can't do anything in that kind of scale unless you pick one or two things because the organization can't implement more than one or two priorities. And then they, um, by the way, he calls himself chief customer officer, not chief executive officer. So that tells you a lot about what they're trying to do. But I would say to you, what I try to do a lot with business people, or if you're trying to run an enterprise yourself, or if you're running just a small a business or you're covering uh, customers, can you pick your top three priorities? That's a question. These are all questions. What's your vision? How are you going to add value? What is your distinctive competence? Second question, what are your top three priorities? The top three. Now, some people can answer like that, and some people may have to go back for three months and interview customers, interview their people, think about changes in the industry, and say, you know what? These used to be our three priorities, but these aren't the right three priorities anymore. The world has changed, or our customer needs have changed. And I work a lot in the technology industry and biotech. You talk about where priorities need to change, they change a lot because the world is changing and competitive, competitive changes. If you did nothing from this talk and we just stopped here, and all you did if you're running a business or an enterprise, or even your own personal portfolio said, what's my vision and what are my top three priorities and, and I'm gonna focus on those three priorities, you would immediately, I would argue, go from being this level of leader to this level of leader. And we don't even need to talk anymore. That's enough, okay? But, and by the way, those are simple things. Everybody here could do them, but it's, I found this one is really hard because you have to choose. For example, I can't be lowest cost, lowest price, highest quality, fastest delivery, best service, widest, of, and no, those things don't go together. You gotta choose. Which do you wanna be? You have to choose. And this is where people, when they actually go to write these down, that's why I'm a big fan, write it down. They realize they don't know because it forces them to make a trade-off. Would I rather be, I wanna attract and retain great people, but I can't pay. We've gotta be very careful on how much we pay. All right, fine. Which is it gonna, you know? You have to make these choices. All right, now, there's one other thing. Once you've, de now on the, on the priorities, same thing. Do you over communicate them? Can you write them down? You gotta over communicate them so your people could repeat them back. Think how powerful this is if you're managing people, if they could repeat back to you your vision. And this includes your assistant, by the way. Your assistant ought to know your vision and priorities. What a waste if he or she doesn't.
And if you can do that, though, all of a sudden, you've, that's a powerful thing. If your customers know your vision and priorities, think what a powerful thing that is. Enormously powerful. Uh, then there's a third thing. How do you spend your time? Now we get to people are always saying to me, you know, I've struggled, struggled with how to manage my time. Any advice on how I should manage my time? Yes, I do. Pick, if, I do have one piece of advice. Pick your top three priorities. It's not that people, all of us, are incapable of managing our time, although some of us are a little ADD, uh, including me. But um, it's that we haven't decided what our three or four top priorities are. And I would argue you need to have a goal of 70% of your time should be spent on your top three or four priorities. Simple as that. That is brutally hard to do. Why? Because people are coming at you all the time asking for your time. And the right answer most of the time is no. You know, the answer most of the time is no. And most of us don't say no because we haven't decided what our top priorities are. And we don't, and we don't want to say no. And also, it's very flattering when somebody comes and asks for your time. But here's the problem. And what I say to executives in particular is pretend it's money. Pretend I substituted the word money for time, okay? So pick a large sum of money that you that thinks of, for, to you that is big. And instead of saying time, I said, how do you spend your money? Would you really say, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, what'd, you, what'd you do, to, how'd you spend your time today or this week? Oh, I don't know, I don't, have a, I don't remember. Uh, well, you just spent a big chunk of time, substitute money. Uh, well, I don't really remember, I don't know, somebody came in, they asked for some of it, I gave it to them, or maybe I shouldn't have. I don't think you'd say that. No, you would not say that at all. You would analyze it, you would scrutinize it, you would, right? And the irony is, your time is more valuable for most people, if you're a leader, than your money. So what the heck are you doing spending your time this way? And so when you say that to people, they realize it's the most valuable asset you have as a leader is your time. It is. And, it, and, it, and by the way, it's gone. Once you spend it, it's like airplane seats. Once the flight takes off, it's gone. You ain't going to get it back. And you've got to learn to use it. And by the way, your people, the time of your people, if you haven't articulated a clear vision with clear priorities, they don't know what they're supposed to do. And I assure you, they're wasting their time. So do the, ask this question for yourself, and it's a good exercise. Do it for your people. Most meetings in business are a waste of time, OK? They are. They're terrible. OK, whatever, except use this meeting to articulate your vision. Spend five minutes. It doesn't take more than that. What are the vision here? The, just remind people, here's our vision. Here are the top three priorities. And get them to do this assignment. That is not a waste of time. And that's something that's a good use, I think, in these meetings. OK, now, uh, I'm going to go through a couple others, and we're going to talk about questions. Once you've done those three things, then, we get, then you're ready to coach people. OK? And so there's the obvious part uh, of business where you lay out a vision and priorities, and you coach people against the vision and the priorities. OK? But you could see if you're not clear on the vision and priorities, i.e., they don't know what you want, uh, it's pretty tough for them to do what you want if they don't know what you want. And so a lot of coaching is really trying to say to people, we said we want to do this, and you coach people against skills they need to develop and actions they need to take to achieve the vision and priorities. It's not an amorphous, you need to improve these skills. It's relative to the key tasks that we're trying to do well. Okay? And that's why a lot of people who are in business are lousy coaches, is A, they don't make it skill-based, their discussion, and they don't relate it back to the vision and the priorities. They're not specific, and they're, it's not specific and actionable. So, that, so we can work with people, and we do work with people in the firm I was in, we work with people on coaching. That's one issue. Let me get to the second issue. The bigger issue is, and I just did, I just did a thing for all the university deans the, as, I did a training thing for all university deans. We had a room there. And I asked, how many of you are a coach? And most of the hands went up. Then I asked, how many of you have a coach? None of the hands go up. So I figured I didn't ask it. You know, that happens sometimes. I didn't ask it clearly. I'm learning. So I said, OK, maybe I didn't ask that right. How many of you do not have a coach? All the hands go up. 
And for those of you who are leaders, how many of you here have a coach? And how many of you here do not have a coach? Okay, and some of you may not think you're supposed to have a coach. <laughs> or you, but fine. But for business people, it's amazing how many leaders will say, I don't have a coach. And this is one thing I have to work with people on. There's one thing, there's a misconception about what coaching is. There's a difference between coaching and mentoring, right? They tend to get used interchangeably. They're not the same. Mentoring means I come and tell you a story, you give me advice based on the story. Your advice is only as good as the story. If I have blind spots, which I do, and all of us do, you're gonna tell me, you're gonna give me advice, but there's a problem with the way I tell you the story because I don't, may not see myself clearly. And this is why people are so shocked at the end of the year, and I've seen this with a number of leaders where my mentor tells me I'm doing a great job at this, my mentor disagrees with you, I don't agree with this feedback I'm getting. Well, the mentor has no idea because the mentor doesn't observe you. Coaching requires observation, direct observation. That's the difference between coaching and mentoring. It's not about responding to a story. You need to get coaching from people who actually observe you. So then the question becomes, who observes you? If you're very senior, it's not, there's nobody above you. It's certainly not people on your board. They see you in the board meeting, I'm sure you're very charming. And those people who are CEOs here are very charming in board meetings. But the people who observe you are your subordinates. And what you have to get people to do is get in the habit of getting coaching from their subordinates. And a lot of them say to me, I can't do that. I'm not supposed to do that. You don't do that. That's a very awkward. I mean, that's an unrealistic suggestion. No. You have the be that's what outstanding leaders do. They get advice from their subordinates. I did it for years. You have to sit with them one-on-one, -on -one, though, and you have to ask, can you give me one thing I need to improve on? And they will eventually give it to you. It will be, uh, reluctantly, it will be devastating. It'll be devastating because you, you'll know it's true. It's, it's pretty fundamental. You'll know everybody thinks it. After they leave, and they'll regret the second they tell you, okay, you'll call home and you'll say, am I really like this? And they'll say on the other end, yeah, that does sound like you. <laughs> and you'll know that you need to work on it. But the biggest fear that leaders have, and we talk about this in presidents, you know, the bubble, the biggest danger that leaders have, and I talk to them about constantly, is isolation. For those of you who are leaders, it's the biggest danger you have, especially if you're an entrepreneur. Okay, you are isolated. People do not, they're thinking, they, believe me, they know your strengths and weaknesses, and they know the problems with the business, and they're dying to tell you, or they're dying to tell their friends. Or if you ever go by a restaurant here downtown, if your office is downtown, and some of the people who work for you are sitting there laughing, you know, they're having dinner and they're having a drink and they're laughing about something. You wonder what they're laughing about? <laughs> they're telling stories about you and the business. Now, screw it, you know, we need to do this, this, and this. And your job is to ask. And if you do it, it's an impressive thing to people. It doesn't make you look weak. It makes the leader look strong. And this is a criticism we make of leaders all the time. Gee, why isn't he surrounded by more business people? Why doesn't he ask advice? He doesn't listen. You know, you've got to do that. And what happens, I found, is when you train your young people to, to give you advice, they come in unsolicited and they warn you about things you're about to screw up. Okay? And it saves you from making big mistakes. Okay. So you get the idea what this is about. All I'm trying to get leaders to do, do you articulate a vision? What is it? Do you, what are your top three priorities? And keep these questions on your wall. How do I spend my time? Does it match my top priorities? Am I getting coaching? When's the last time I got coaching? Uh, and normally the way problems for leaders manifest themselves is basically is a dull headache. You got a problem, you feel lousy, the business is doing lousy, or it's not doing as well, and you don't. Unfortunately, on businesses, once it shows up in the results, you're way late, okay? Sometimes it's too late by that point to fix it. And so, but you can tell something's wrong. And so this is a little bit almost a dashboard or checklist of questions to say, when's the last time I sought advice from some of my subordinates? Get out there, you know, and, and ask these questions and it helps keep people out of trouble. Now, let me just zip through what the other questions are. Then I'm gonna stop so we can ask questions. I talk a lot about succession planning 
in big companies and even small companies, this is a big deal. And it's not because you, it's not because, uh, you know, when we talk about Warren Buffett, there's a constant discussion of does he have a successor. That's a good thing, it's a good exercise, but for me, it's important as you build a business, you need to pick people, you don't have to anoint them or tell them who could take your place. And the reason I want people to do it is because you'll build a stronger business. It gives you people to delegate to. When you have a mismatch between your time and your priorities, who do you delegate to those things that you shouldn't be spending time on? Delegate them to your subordinates. Test people out. Um, if you don't do these things, and I'm not gonna talk about this tonight, I've never met anybody who is a bottleneck who thinks they're a bottleneck, okay? That nobody thinks they're a bottleneck. But if you're not clear on your vision and priorities, and you don't coach people, I'm certain you're a bottleneck, because people cannot possibly make a decision on their own, because they don't know what you want. They've got to check with you. And you're creating, and by the way, some people who run businesses love it that way, because it makes them feel important. You know, it's an insecurity thing, and that's a whole nother discussion, but it means you're a bottleneck. And in this day and age, as we know, you can't, where you gotta run businesses lean and you, you can't have more people. You know, there's, it's a cost to having more people than you need. I, there's a whole series of questions on this. I won't go through it tonight. This is the big one, the last one though, that does get people in trouble. Uh, and I call it evaluation, but, the, but basically for years I've been doing, the last 20 years, with businesses and, and working in my own business and others, you gotta look at your enterprise. By the way, this is true in the way you manage your personal finances, the way you manage your every, anything you do. Uh, given how the world has changed, does it still make sense? This is the hardest question i found for leaders to answer because it requires getting some perspective. And the best way I know how to answer it is pretend. It's a mental device. Pretend you have a clean sheet of paper, we're starting from scratch. Is this really the way you'd invest your money? Really? Really? Is this given, based on your vision and your top priorities, is this really what you would do? Is this really the way you would run this company? Is this the, really the type of people? Do we have the right kind of people in this company? Are we even seated in the right way? Why are we doing things this way? Is it because we've always done them, but does it still make sense? The leaders got to ask this question. Now, I work with lots of leaders and they say to me, Rob, I cannot ask that question in this business. It will freak people out. It will scare them. And what I learn from meeting people in their firm or their company is the opposite. What's freaking your people out is they're afraid you're not asking this question. Believe me, they're on the front lines. They know things are screwed up. Their fear is that you don't know and that you're afraid to make changes so, we, so the business can get back on track. Leaders think the people are afraid for them to inquire because they don't want to change things. It's the opposite. Believe me, your young people, if you run a business, they want, they're praying that you're asking these questions because they want to work here for the next 15, 20 years. And they're afraid that you're not asking th these questions, that you're isolated. And the questions that you, in a, in a business normally have, are we recruiting the right people? Does the compensation still make sense? We want to promote teamwork in this business. Do we pay for teamwork? A lot of people don't. They pay just for production. But we want more teamwork. Well, maybe you need to think about the compensation. Are you promoting the right people? Are you promoting people based on the things you believe in? Or we're promoting people the way we always did. It just doesn't fit the business anymore. Um, all these factors leader has at their disposal and people are, hate to ask this question. It's a very traumatic thing. And I found even for myself, you build a business, and I built several at my firm, and then you're so close to it, I can't stand to change it. I'm comfortable. So what I used to do is take some of those successors, take three or four up and coming young people, give them this assignment. It was painful the first time I did it. But I basically said, you go look. If we're running this business with a clean sheet of paper, how would we do it? And no sacred cows, go off for a month in addition to your JA job, come back with recommendations. I may not agree with everything you recommend, but I want to hear it. And invariably, you'll get fabulous recommendations and some of the best changes that got me from being, kept me from being killed and allowed me to continue my career came from these little task forces I created 
basically, let's look at it with a clean sheet of paper. But this could apply to you in anything you're doing. You've got to ask this question. Got to ask this question. Um, I won't go through role models. I, 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 that was a good little picture, I think. Um, anyhow, so role model, but this is a big thing for people who get promoted up and they forget they go from being a junior person to a senior person. And they, they, they realize they have to, people are watching you. They're all, as a leader, you know, as a parent, people are watching you. They're watching every move you make. As a leader, they're watching every move you make. You know, I don't, they don't look like they're watching because they're never even looking at you, but they're watching every move you make. They're particularly watching what you do when you're under pressure. And in particular, they particularly watch you closely when you make a mistake. They want to see how you react when you screw up. Do you blame someone else? Do you act like you weren't involved? Do you like, do you like just act, you know, like, I don't even know how that happened. You act like you weren't even there. You know, you're talking to third person all of a sudden, like you weren't even involved. They watch that, they notice it, and they will mimic you. And if you behave in a way that is um, uncooperative or you blame others, They'll learn, that the, they'll, they'll learn the lesson all right. They'll learn to cover their fannies because that's what you do. And so I've seen cultures of companies where you do everything right except the leader under pressure. 99% of the time the leader does all the right things, but, but irrelevant. People care about what you do under pressure when you screwed up. Better yet, when they screwed up and you have to take the hit for it. What are you going to do? You're going to stand up maybe cover for them or no or do you run for the cut run for the hills means a lot to your people so I talk to a lot to leaders and I can do this because Harvard Business School is like Switzerland you know I talk to leaders that, who run companies about what creates pressure for them and why can't they stand up under pressure and this is a deeper conversation which uh, has to do with their own idiosyncrasies anxieties insecurities but it comes out when you're a leader. Uh, I won't go through this. So let me stop there. You get the idea. Uh, you know, leadership is not about having all the answers. It's about asking the right questions. And the corollary to all this, and this is the next book I'm writing right now, is, um, so I wrote this book, and it's about all the things you should do as a leader. Lots of people who've run businesses have read it. Great, all good. There's one little problem that it doesn't address. Why can't I do it? Okay, and what I mean by why can't I do it, okay, you want me to coach people? I just can't confront people. I can't. I don't know why I can't. I just can't. Okay? And so one of the things we work a lot at Harvard, uh, in this class, The Authentic Leader, is, okay, we've already taught you all the skills you need to do. That's a big, that's a huge job to teach leaders and for all of us as leaders to learn the skills, then why am I afraid? Why am I so scared? You know, why, why can't I make that move that I know I'd, I'd be good for me to make? Why can't I do it? And this uh, borders on uh, psychiatry or psychology without a license, but it's the, it's the second thing, which we can talk more about. You've got to understand yourself to be a leader. The most important person you're gonna manage is you. And that means, you have to understand your life story. As silly as that sounds, like oh, my, my life story, I know my life story, you don't talk to me about my life story. Really, do you? Could you write down your own life story? Just the, just the facts. And what is the failure narrative out of that story? There's a spin on every story. So there's the, out of every story in your life, there's a, there's a big success hero story. Crosby told mine, Rob left Kansas and became uh, this, and then you got this, and this, and this, and my mom is sitting there and she's going, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. And that's the hero story. So then there could be, there's, so, uh, but the problem is that's not the story in my head. And it's not the story in your head. As a leader, you got another story in your head or variations of it, which I'd call the failure or self-doubt story. You know, there was that time when I tried out for the baseball team when I was 12, and when I, did, I never forgot that, and I never didn't make the team. And then I had this traumatic experience, and then I was kind of awkward as a kid, and my clothes were too big, I sweated a lot when I went to parties, you know, talking to girls, I was sweaty, you ever see those sweaty kids? I, I used to ask my dad, you know, why do I sweat? So it's healthy to sweat. But you know, I'd say, but it's, it's, it's very awkward, dad. And so, 
there's all these things in your story that gets you to, and when you get, they don't come out until later when it's time you're on the big stage. I used to have a petrified to talk in front of a thousand people, and I had to do it a lot. So I turned down getting promoted to head of investment banking twice until my boss, who was Hank Paulson, was about ready to kill me. And so the way they promoted me to head of investment banking is they just brought me in one day and they said, congratulations, you're head of investment banking. They learned, don't even ask this knucklehead, just tell them. Because I was afraid, I couldn't say it, I was afraid to speak in front of a group of a thousand people. And I know if I was head of banking, I'd have to do that. I didn't want to do it, I was scared. Didn't even know why, okay? The point of this is, to be a leader, you gotta understand yourself a little bit and it's worth spending time on that. So let me stop, that's a little snippet. Let's go to questions.